Thank you very much. Okay, so, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, this, so this is joint work with uh, uh, Kyle Emrick, who was a former student and is now starting as assistant professor at Tufts, Alain, and Mansour Da, who is at the International Rice Research Institute uh, in New Delhi. So uh, I think let me start by saying I think we all know that risk uh, is, important in, is important in agriculture, and risk has some very high costs on the farmers. Uh, this is something that we have, we have been concerned for a long time, but here I want to look at something in more detail. Then there is, in a way, two uh, mechanisms through which risk of extreme weather events, so we're going to concentrate on extreme weather events, affect farmers. One, uh, one are the one type of cost are the direct costs, so dam damages to crops, homes, livestock. So this is the immediate cost after the storm of everything you have lost. The second type of uh, mechanism that uh, negatively affects the farmers is all what they have to do, uh, the self-insurance sort of action that they have to take, conservative decision they have to make to reduce, to reduce their exposure to risk. And this often at the expense of lower profitability. So choice of crops, which are less sensitive to weather shocks, crops of uh, variety, level of input use, not, ex not uh, undertaking expens uh, expensive uh, input use when you may lose them, and some of management techniques. So our question uh, is to here is to focus on the second mechanism. And the way we're going to do that is to infer what is the, to infer the negative cost of risk. We're going to do uh, something on the positive side. We're going to see what sort of the positive uh, consequences of alleviating the risk. And so this is how we're going to infer negatively what would be normally, what was the cost of risk. So the question that we are asking is, can, can a new technology that make agricultural output less susceptible to weather extreme card in investment that, people, that farmers did not undertake before because they were too risky? Now, if this is the case, and it's going to be the case, I will show you, then it means that the technologies that, that sort of reduce risk for the farmer for the bad years also are going to boost agricultural output in the normal years. And I think this is sort of a new insight into the, the way to address risk, which is uh, quite interesting. The approach that we, uh, that we take in this paper is a pretty uh, straightforward. It's a two-year field experiment that we conducted in 128 villages in Odisha uh, in India. We allocate, the first year, we allocated five kilograms of flood tolerant rice seeds, which is called Swana sub one, and come to back to it in a minute, to a random subset of farmers. It's a very standard randomized control trial. Five, five farmers randomly selected in each of 64 villages, half of the villages randomly selected as well. The first year, that was in 2011, the summer of 2011, there was very large floods that occurred in many villages during the first year. This is really bad for the farmers, terrible for them, but in a way, uh, good luck for us, because then, right the first year, we could uh, verify the agronomic properties of that seed that we had given to the farmers, and verify on the, in the farmer's field and cultivated by them with no help and no support from any one of us, and as opposed to being in experimental station uh, done by the, by the uh, by Erie before. Second year, uh, 2012, uh, this was a normal uh, year with uh, normal rail rainfall, so good luck for the farmers this time, finally, but good luck for us as well, because then we are going to see all the changes in behavior that, that they undertook because they knew of the seed, and we are going to see large changes in investment, but also we're going to see, I'm going to show you that, changes in savings and credit use, and we're going to see a large aggregate effect on yield and on production. Remember, immediately the second year, this is extremely fast. Now, because there was no flood, we know that all the results that we find, the aggregate effect on production is solely due to the behavioral change. So can, we can really separate how much 
can be due to the agronomic property of the seed. This is the first year. How much is due to the uh, farmer's behavior respond the second year, and we can compare the order of magnitude. So let me show you very briefly the result of the first year. So Swarna sub one, this is the new seed, the flood tolerant rice variety. variety. It's similar to Swarna, it's actually exactly the Swarna, uh, which is a common variety used throughout Eastern Yunda, throughout uh, Eastern India, in which the scientists have introduced just one specific gene that make it uh, flood tolerant. And it's very, it's particularly flood ter tolerant for the period which is five to 14 days of flood. You see this on the graph, on the horizontal axis, you have the number of days of flood. And in our experiment, we had filled with no days, uh, no flooding at all, a little bit higher. And then we had fields in any one of these area, but you see more, f f a lot of fields at 10 to tw 12 uh, days of flood. And what's represented on the vertical axis is the difference between, in percentage uh, term, between the yield in the, f in the different field according to the uh, number of days they were flooded. Two things very important to see on this graph. First, that at the lower end, when there is no zero to five days of uh, flooding, there's no difference. So there's no trade-off. That Swarna sub one is no worse uh, in good a year than, than the Swarna. And then we see the, uh, the great value is really between five and 14 days. Beyond 15 days, we had actually had almost no experiment, but we know that it's not doing too well anywhere. It turns out, so, this, so what the technology does, and I'll come back on that, is that it's going to cut on the, on the bad years to, to raise the yield, so cut the losses on the bad years, with no negative effect on the good years. So that is mean that it both increases the expected value, the expected return of whatever you do, the expected yield, and reduce the variance of yield. So we're going to have to be careful to distinguish those two. It also turns out, but that's just because this is the way India is, it also uh, turns out that it is pro-poor. Uh, why is it pro-poor? Well, where do you think, uh, who do you think is cultivating the most marginal land and the most which are more prone to flood? Well, the lower caste for a number of reasons, historical marginalization, and therefore it turns out that in fact the lower castes are going to benefit even more because from this uh, protection from flood. How does sub one work? Just a little bit of minimum of agronomy. Now, most of the, uh, most of the uh, rice uh, seeds, when flooding comes, they elongate to try to keep their head uh, above the water and keep that. And then after when the water recedes, they just uh, fall and have lost all their energy, which has been used to, to uh, grow up. What someone does, he just holds his breast, stay underneath, stay put, wait until the water recedes, and then has all his energy and start to grow up. And that's why it's called actually the scuba, uh, scuba rice in India. And you see here the fields after the uh, flooding, still a bit on the thing, okay? The, uh, the theoretical framework we have in mind is very standard. It's a standard multi-period household model where production is risky. There's very simple in the model, flood or no flood. And this is done, and the flood ha happened after the input choice. That's very important. It comes late in the season after you have, you have planted and put the fertilizer or most of the fertilizer. The return in the model, the return to inputs is lower on the flood uh, conditions, so this is the and the modern technology increases the return to inputs on the flood, but has no difference on the normal conditions to respond to what we saw the first year. So it protects, uh, it's, it's a protection on the downward risk with no penalty on the, uh, on the good uh, circumstances. The prediction of the model, there's two uh, sort of prediction. One is sort of the productivity effect, the fact that the technology increases the expected return to inputs, then you should increase uh, your inputs and your investment in any way, even if it was not a risk issue. And then there's the insurance effect, which is the fact that the technology reduces losses in bad states, and therefore it reduced the, uh, it, it reduced the risk, and it allows to, for you to reduce the risk mitigation behavior and the precautionary savings. And we should see that increasing with risk aversion. 
In terms of econometric specifications, so we're going to have, a because it's a randomized control trial, a very simple specification, where it's going to be either at the farm or the plot level, um, or, uh, well, it depends on the question we're asking. Essentially, why on the left-hand side is some of the outcomes that we are interested in, we'll I'll look at that in a minute, as a function directly, a linear function, of whether uh, the treatment variable is whether the farmer had received, so it's randomized control trial again, so that's uh, orthogonal to anything else, whether the farmer had received uh, those seeds the first year, and then uh, a block, um, block fixed effect and the, uh, some control variable as well. We had some farmers with, who disadopted for different reasons. Uh, their, their seed bed was flooded or they, uh, they ate their seeds or they mixed them with the others, different reasons. And some we figured out to get those uh, seeds from some of their friends. But of course this is endogenous, so we are going to everywhere use the intention to treat effect. I mean, we, what we call the treatment is having received seeds, whatever you did with it. And if you haven't received it and you managed to have it, you still counted, counted in the control group. And this is pretty standard. The outcome of the interest that we will be looking at, so the Y that I had in the previous size, uh, are a number of uh, inputs and manag management practices, rice area, fertilizer use, especially we're going to contrast the fertilizer of the early fertilizer that you put at the beginning of the season as opposed to the one that you put later in the, time, in, in the season. Use of traditional varieties as a way to protect against risk and planting method, then yield, which I mentioned before, credit and precautionary savings. So let me go through a number of tables here. Uh, you can just listen to me or look at those numbers, whichever. So the treatment variable is the one which is written original mini kit recipient which you have there. And here what we see is that uh, all these are three different ways to show that flood tolerance increases the area cultivated. We see the number of plots increasing by almost 0.7 on a mean value of 3.6, so this is a large increase. The rice area of 0.10 hectares on an average value of one and or in log of 9% increase. So a 9-10% increase in the log areas coming through increasing in number of plots. Right, so we keep that here. But I don't have the, uh, the detail here, but those plots that were brought into cultivation were the more flood-prone and marginal plots. That's right. Now look at the uh, impact on the use of fertilizer. So here there's three types of fertilizer. I don't know very much what they are, but maybe some of you do. One, which is called DAP, is is put very early on, just after the transplanting. Uh, the, the one, the MOP, is put later on in the, uh, on the field, in the middle of season, and the latest one, the urea, is put just at very late. And in a sense, uh, those who are more uh, subject to be more at risk of being lost are the earliest one because you have to put them before you know whether you have flooding or not, as you only put the urea if, you have, if, your, if your field has not been destroyed. And we see here, again, the uh, parameter, which is on the original mini recipients, a very strong increase in fertilizer, the early fertilizer, by 18 uh, kilograms on a mean value of 80 kilograms. So this is really a large increase. A little bit uh, some increase in the one in MOP, which is put in the middle of the period, and no change in, in urea, which is the latest that you've put in. So this is some indication of an increase in fertilizer, but very specifically the fertilizer which is used early. Then there is, uh, th there is still some traditional varieties, which are not the modern varieties, which have much lower uh, yield, whatever the condition, but have one particular advantage is that there is, a, there is less risk of complete failure, especially beyond 12 days, 10, 12 days of, uh, of, uh, 10, 12 days of flooding, right? Uh, and then the third input that we want to look at is the, way, the different way to, uh, to seize the field. There's a labor, very labor-intensive uh, 
method, which is a transplanting, which we actually, if you go a tiny bit outside of Hanoi, you're going to see this extensively nowadays, which is the transplanting one, one, one plant at the time. And there is a, a low, uh, a much less uh, labor intensive way, which is simply to broadcasting, broadcasting, that's sending the seeds, but has a much, uh, much lower yielding, um, much lower yield uh, output after that. Okay, so let's look at those three inputs that we look at. So again, the original mini kit recipients, those are the ones that receive five kilograms of, uh, of uh, the sub one seeds the first year. And we see that, uh, well, they use less swana, that's sort of what we would expect because we just gave them a replacement seed, which was no worse. But they also use less of the traditional variety by uh, 4% of them, on an average of 28% of the farmers, do use some amount of traditional variety. Uh, number of observations, sorry, this is the, at the plot level. 4% of the plot, when 20% of the plot. And then, uh, in terms of broadcast, uh, again, a, a very large decrease in the uh, use of broadcasting, therefore using transplanting instead and a decrease, you see the last column, of the number of plots which, is not, which are not cultivated as well, which is what I mentioned the first time. Overall, when you aggregate all these sort of in, more intensive input use, we see a shift on the average productivity uh, of the, the yield, therefore average yield in kilogram per hectare, of 283 kilograms or about 10%. Okay, let's keep this number in, uh, in mind. I think is, we want to comp If you compare that, we're going to compare that to what we had. Uh, it's comparable to what we were obtaining just from the, from the uh, agronomic result of the on the first, the year when there was uh, flooding. So this year there was no flooding. All this average productivity increase is solely due to the input or to the behavior of the farmers, 10% increase in yield. Two more uh, results here. One on credit. So we see a large increase in credit. Now, we don't know whether this is higher demand from credit, which could be, but it's also be higher supply that the, actually, the bank actually will give credit to those who have those seeds because it's less risky. Uh, What's interesting here in this, when you contrast column two and three, is the credit which is given early in the season, which increases by 5.4% on a mean dependent mean value, which is pretty small, which is only 14% of the farmer receive credit. Finally, something which is very interesting is we see less uh, savings of, of seed, of, of uh, less saving of grains, as we call them, less saving of grains for the next year. Now, they had a higher production, so you would expect that they could, uh, they, that they, they sell more, when in sense you would, you would ex they had a higher uh, production, so in many ways you would expect that they, would, they could save more of that if they wanted to, if they were short, or you could say that they would expect to have more the next year. But uh, the fact that we see that there is less uh, saving of grains at any level of production suggests that it is, uh, it is really due, it is really, uh, um, response to the risk of not having enough for the next year. Now, so let me summarize all these results. So there is the conclusion here is that the, we see, um, the results suggest that there is, the risk strongly influences the decision on the inputs. So this is on the second year. On input, 10% increase in rice area, 11% in fertilizer use, especially the, at the beginning of the season, 15% less re reliance on the traditional variety, 33% less use of broadcast planting, and uh, this aggregate to an approximate 10% increase in yield, five percentage point less savings of output for future consumption, and 36% increase in credit use. This is just one year after the introduction of the seed. Now, the main explanation that we've given is that it's the reduction is, is, is due to the reduction in risk. But of course, we could have other explanations which are possible. And the one that I mentioned in the beginning, maybe it's solely due to the aggregate expected return that we have. 
uh, and because the fact that we have that it's uh, protect against downward risk without penalty in good years means that it increases the expected return and reduces risk at the same time. Now, both of these effects could be responsible for much of the result that I have. So to distinguish them, we have to look in more detail. And I think I mentioned then as I presented the result. Uh, one, one of the indicators that is due to risk rather than expected return is the, it's the increase in fertilizer is concentrated on the early fertilizer and not the late fertilizer. Now, those are complementary, those fertilizers. So you would not increase one without the other if it was solely due to the expected return. We saw also the land that's brought into production is the low quality land and the land which is more prone to flood. And we see the result, I didn't show them to you, the results are generally larger for most risk averse farmers. And the share of production which is saved is lower at any level of production, even among those who had relatively low level of production. So it has, there's two other potential explanations, wealth effect, could it be due to the fact that we gave to some people some seeds, some new seeds at the beginning? No, I won't want, and so they are wealthier, and therefore they can afford more input. Uh, we look in fair amount of detail in this, uh, to this, but it's unlikely. First, we give them very little, only five kilograms of seeds. And then even if we condition on the harvest that they had the first year, because they had much better harvest, we, we have no change of result. Could it be to the output prices? You would expect that this miracle seed would be much uh, higher price. It turns out that it's not really high, much higher price, only 4.6% higher price. And there's very few farmers, on, well, not very few, there's only 40% of the farmer who sold any output at all. And the results are, are robust only considering the farmers that did not sell anything. So it cannot be coming from the price. So let me conclude, and this is my last slide. So we see a very large reduction. Um, no, we see that when we have less uh, risk reduction from, from this uh, weather flood resilient technology, and we see that it helps cope with shocks in bad years, uh, this is the and it helps reduce risk management and self-insurance in normal years. In a sense, we knew that before, right? We, I think we've learned that, models tell us that, we've learned that in all our textbook, that uh, risk is really bad, not only because you, you need to have instruments of risk coping afterwards to manage it, but then it pushes you to do risk management. We knew that, and we may, probably did not need an RCT to do it. What really we learn, at least for us, at that is the order of magnitude. And I think we completely, I mean, at least us, in our team, we completely underestimated the order of magnitude. So let's look at those two numbers together. The average gain in normal years from risk management was 283 kilograms in this group of 2,000 and some uh, farmers. And that's about equal to the average avoided loss in bad years from shock coping, which is 250 kilograms. And this was a really bad year. I mean, we don't have time series, but that was a really bad flood year. So the order of magnitude of what we gain in the good years is as large as the uh, size of what you, the avoided loss in bad years. Now, how many good years, how many bad years we have? Well, we don't have a uh, very good time series on that, but uh, actually we have a bit more than that. I think we have had two of these uh, bad years in the, last, in the last seven years in this area. So we definitely have more normal years than we have bad years. That means that the uh, behavioral spillover effects exceed the gains from the shock coping, the agronomic intended purpose uh, effect from the, from the uh, scientist uh, in, expect, in expected value. Of course, it's not the same years. So of course, for, the, for IRI, our counterparts, who, had, who were really developing that seed for those bad years, this is very good news. I think it's very good news for all of us to see how reducing risk has very strong positive impact even for the good years and overall for the production of rice. Thank you. <laughs>